So welcome everybody. Uh, today's talk. Uh, yes. can, uh, can everybody hear us? Can you confirm that uh, you're can hear us? Okay. Uh, it is a pleasure to have us uh, today in our weekly seminar. Yorgos Korkidis. Korkidis, he's coming from uh, the University of Crete. Uh, he's uh, at the end of his uh, PhD studies. His uh, bachelor degree got uh, he also from the University of Crete. And uh, as you can already see in the title, the subject is about cosmology, cosmology at the edges. And uh, we are very glad uh, to, uh, to listen to your talk. Can go on. Um, hello, thank you, thank you very much for joining and for having me. Um, I changed the title on the fly. Uh, I decided to make it a, a bit more specific to what I will talk to you today. So um, uh, I will talk today about my work on structure formation. Uh, and in particular for a specific scale of structure formation, the turnaround scale. And I will try to um, investigate the potential of this scale uh, in order to probe cosmology. Um, so if that moves, no. Mm -mm. Okay, so. What is the turnaround scale? Uh, the turnaround scale appears very naturally in the context of the spherical collapse model. That's the simplest model in order to um, um, to study the non-spherical collapse, the non-linear collapse of uh, large-scale structures. Uh, you assume we assume that we have spherical symmetry actually. So, for example, let's say that this blue circle here is um, a cluster of galaxies. Uh, which is very realized. That means it does not expand or contract under gravity, it is stable. Uh, and then in the spherical collapse model assumes that the collapse of the surrounding material takes place isotropically. That is, we have material distributed isotropically around the, the structure. Uh, and of course, as we go out, the velocity of, the, of this materi material, the infall velocity becomes less and less. Uh, and at some point we find the expanding universe. So the turnaround is the point at which galaxies, if we have galaxies isotropically distributed around, uh, where the galaxies uh, don't know what to do. Uh, should they fall towards the uh, expanding structure or, or should they expand along with the background universe? This is where the turnaround uh, scale is. Uh, the interesting about this scale um, is that in the context of the spherical collapse model, uh, the matter density enclosed uh, in a sphere where it has um, a radius, the turnaround, as a radius, the turnaround radius, um, the density there is a universal quantity in, in the context of this model. That means that whether we are uh, studying a big cluster of galaxies or a small cluster of galaxies, um, we expect to have turn around, according to the model, uh, when the value of the density reaches a specific threshold, right? And this value is only dependent on the contents of the universe and the cosmic time, so the contents of the, the cosmology, right? Now we can see, um, by solving the equations, uh, it, which, by the way, are essentially the Friedman equations. The model is very, very simple because we assume spherical symmetry. But if we solve the equations uh, for the turnaround density, this is on the y-axis. This is the turnaround density normalized with respect to the critical density in order to have a flat universe. So we call this omega turnaround. This is the logarithm on the y-axis. And on the x-axis, we have the logarithm of the scale factor, which means uh, that the future times are for values uh, beyond zero, this direction here, and past times of the universe is this direction here. And we we plot the in this in this figure we plot the uh, we try to see how the turnaround density changes with time for three different models. 
Now, these models are, are most of them, or the two of them are no longer in favor uh, because the concordance model is the Lambda CDM one, but in order to refresh your memory, uh, a standard CDM um, cosmo cosmological model is a model that is flat. We have a flat universe with only uh, dark matter content. Uh, an open CDM universe is a universe that has an open geometry and has only uh, cold dark matter. And the lambda CDM is a flat universe with um, lambda dominating a lambda cosmological constant uh, dominating the dynamics. So the idea here is that at early times where we have uh, dark matter domination, uh, regardless of whether you have a cosmological constant or not, uh, the turnaround density evolves as the mean matter density in the universe because we have matter domination. At later times though, uh, and this is the important part, uh, where at some point either the cosmological constant will dominate or the curvature, the curvature component will dominate, uh, the turnaround density changes. The, the, its evolution with cosmic time changes. So if we have a lambda, uh, we expect it asymptotically to, to reach a constant value. And practically, this would mean that at such a universe, there is an end to structure formation because you can think, you can think of it um, in this way. Imagine that you have a big structure that is accreting material. Uh, and then its turnaround radius naturally will expand uh, over time. So, and so the density as time passes will fall the turnaround density. Uh, if there is an upper bound to this value of the density, when it reaches that bound, then it will no longer expand. It will no longer be able to, to accrete the material, material from its surroundings. And so that was actually one of the initial ideas behind this project. Uh, so the idea was that since there is an upper bound in a lambda CDM universe to um, to the to how much uh, a structure can uh, expand, uh, then if we were to measure a single structure that was that was to violate this bound, then that would be enough to falsify um, the lambda CDM uh, model. Uh, that was the idea, but we have improved since then. Actually, um, now. The way in which we presented this figure in, in, um, in the paper um, was this one. The, the previous one was a bit more cartoonish in order to, um, to highlight the point between the different models. But uh, the, the problem um, with um, the idea that the turnaround density will, will reach a constant value asymptotically is that we can not wait infinitely long in order to observe that behavior. Right, um, and the good news is that according to the spherical collapse model, if we have a lambda CDM universe, then uh, we expect the turnaround density to evolve as alpha to the minus one point five already. Uh, whereas, if we don't have a lambda component, it should go forever as alpha to the minus three. Which means that if we were to measure the turnaround density at present time and uh, at our near past, then we should expect to be able to probe cosmology. That's the idea. Uh, another way to, to see the same figure, um, but now we, we are plotting on the x-axis the redshift, uh, so the past is to the right this time, uh, is, yeah, so as we see, if we try to see how the turnaround density evolves with redshift this time, uh, we can already get the feeling that up to a redshift of 0.3, we can start to see a split between the different models. So um, in principle, if we were to make this measurement up to a redshift of 0.3, we should expect to be able to probe cosmology. That's the idea. Now, what probe, uh, no, or rather what constraints we, we, we should expect to get if we were to make such an experiment is um, we can see that in this figure here, where with the pink contours, we we plot the ex the expected um, constraints of the cosmological parameters, omega matter and omega lambda. If we were to measure the turnaround density with a 50% error for some tens of thousands of clusters, which is uh, an, a number of clusters that we have observed, actually. So this is the constraint that we should expect in this case. And I want to highlight at this point that 
in my opinion, the important thing about um, about this figure is not so much the size of the of the constraints, which would uh, vary if we had uh, uh, worse error bars on on the turnaround density, but rather the fact that the slope of this of these constraints are unique. Uh, and I mean by that that we get complementary um, um, constraints on the parameters uh, with respect to the bar and acoustic oscillations, the CMB and the supernova measurements. So I think that this is important. Um, now, that's what we expect from the spherical collapse model. So now a question is whether this prediction holds uh, for realistic structures. So the next step was uh, to go to simulated clusters at different cosmologies, identify where the turnaround radius is, and then see whether the density that you find in this uh, scale um, is in accordance to the prediction of the model. Uh, this is a very typical typical uh, cluster as we expect. So these are realistic structures from simulations. Now the projector doesn't make justice to the col to the colors, but uh, actually different. What we see here is the projected dark matter density at the X Y plane uh, around the big cluster in a lambda CDM uh, simulation. So different colors track the um, higher um, dark matter concentrations naturally. Uh, with the black circle, you see uh, the R200. This is um, the radius where uh, the matter, uh, the density is 200 times the mean matter density. We usually quote that as the radius where the structure is relaxed. This is a convention mostly. Uh, but let's assume for the sake of this presentation that this is actually where uh, the, this cluster is relaxed. And with the red circle, you, we see the turnaround density. Now, from this figure, um, straight off the bat, we cannot uh, very much distinguish why we the turnaround radius is there. But if you see the, the, the figure on the right, uh, where we plot, again, the projection of uh, dark matter particles on the XY plane around the cluster. But now with the different colors, uh, we depict um, the median value of the radial velocities with respect to the center of the structure. That means that with the blue hues here, we see matter that is infalling, that's going towards the center of the structure. And with red, we see stuff that are expanding, that they are moving away from the center. And as you can see, now the turnaround density is much, much more apparent, even though, uh, and it, it seems to look like a, uh, like a sphere, even though the structure is not, is not, a, is not spherical, right? Um, so this is to get an intuitive feeling about the turnaround scale, where 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 is it and what it does uh, to the dynamic, what happens to the dynamics of the structure there, and now the way to measure this radius in um, simulations is by looking at the radial velocity profile of 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 the clusters. So in these two panels, we have a big cluster of galaxies and a smaller cluster of galaxies on the right. Uh, on the y-axis, we plot the average radial velocity of particles uh, with respect to their distance from the center. So we essentially have done um, a binning in spherical cells, and we we plot the radial velocity, the, the average radial velocity in each cell as a function of the distance of the cell from the center, right? So here we can see that the uh, velocities are on average around zero, which means that around here, the structure is sort of relaxed, uh, where in truth it is not relaxed because here there is uh, a big accretion regime. So we have lots of stuff at higher distances that are falling towards the center. And this, mat this material will interrupt the relaxation process of the structure. But what we can see very clearly here and what is of interest to us is the turnaround radius, which is 
uh, a unique point after which all radial velocities are positive, which means that material that are at these um, scales are expanding. They are following the expansion of the universe. And this is the same whether we are looking at a big structure or a small structure. So what I did was to go to simulations um, at different cosmic times and at different cosmologies. So I picked uh, different cosmological models um, and I, I took a big sample at each redshift of about um, 500 clusters. I measured the, their uh, turnaround radius of each of them. I found the mass in there because these are simulations, I can do whatever I like. And so I measured for each cluster the value of the turnaround density. Um, and what I found was that the agreement between the prediction of the model and the model is pretty substantial. That means with the different points here, you can, we can see um, the average value of the turnaround density. Now we have normalized that with respect to the critical. That's why I have the omega here, but this is the turnaround density. The points depict the average value from simulations at different cosmic times at, and at different cosmologies. A lambda CDM, an open CDM, open geometry, and a standard CDM. Flat universe, no cosmological constant. And as we can see, the, the realistic structures do a pretty decent job in, in, um, in, in so they are in a very good agreement with the spherical collapse model. That's what, what this uh, plot uh, means to, um, to communicate. So up till now, we've seen that the spherical collapse model predicts that the turnaround density and its evolution with cosmic time can probe cosmology. Mm -hmm. We have seen that while this model is pretty idealistic in the sense that it assumes spherical symmetry, uh, realistic structures are in agreement with this model. And now we need to address the question of how we can uh, observe this quantity on the sky. Uh, now, in order to address that, I will need to return to the spherical collapse model, and you will have to bear with me because I need some time to unpack the idea. It's not straightforward how we do that. But let's return to the spherical collapse model. Now, the typical, you know, uh, historical spherical collapse model of the 80s um, does has some very simplifying assumptions uh, aside from the fact that we assume spherical symmetry. One such assumption is that in, in, in the spherical collapse model, a structure becomes virialized, it relaxes when the density becomes infinite. So it sort of assumes that after the turnaround, stuff just fall and collapse to the center and you have a black hole or something, right? This is not realistic because we know that actual structures are relaxed and they, you know, we, we don't have infinite uh, density there. So one, uh, one improvement that people have historically attempted to this model is to assume that we have cell crossing. Now, if we assume um, that, you know, let's say that we have actually cold dark matter that is completely collisionless, right? And we, we keep the assumption of spherical symmetry. So we have these spherical cells. Now, what such a cell that is collisionless will do as time passes by? It will contract, it will collapse at the center, and then what it will do, it will start expanding again, right? So it we will sort of find ourselves with a structure where it has many cells that are oscillating, their radius is oscillating. So they are contracting and they are expanding. And if they are losing energy, which they will do due to the uh, many body interactions that they will have in there, their, um, this oscillation, will, the, the radius of the oscillation will decrease over time until at some point they collapse at the center. Now, if we have many such cells, what happens is that, um, let's say we have a unique cell, right? Or a simple galaxy, a simple point that is turning around initially, then starts falling towards the center, uh, it passes through the center with maximum velocity, and then it starts decelerating as it moves outwards again, right? So what we expected to do 
uh, after that is to turn around again. So after the first turnaround where the particle was detached from the expanding universe, it will turn around again when it passes through the center and then it will start, it will continue with its oscillation. At this second turnaround, we expect the particle to stop for a point, for, for a minute, right? So if we have infinitely many such particles, what we expect to see in these cell crossing models is the creation of caustics at the radii yeah, smaller than the turnaround. A caustic is a thin layer, let's say, of, of material that has accreted. There is, a, let's say it is a spike in the density, in, in the density as a function of radius. So we expect due to this second turnaround or the third turnaround, because it will do this oscillation, each time it stops, we expect to find ourselves with a, with a concentration of particles, right? Um, now, even in the case where we do not have a uh, spherical symmetry, that is, oh, um, in the case of simulations, we can see these caustics. Now, this is um, a simulated cluster from, um, this is from the work of Benedict Dimmer of uh, University of, of Maryland. Uh, now, and what he has done uh, is very interesting because he has uh, developed an algorithm where he can um, distinguish between the orbiting material, the orbiting particles of a cluster in simulations from the infalling material. And so this here depicts the projected density of the orbiting material, this of the infalling material, and this is the combination of them all, what you would see uh, actually. And here, what we see on the middle panels are the radial velocities uh, as a function of the radius from the center. But now he has plotted all the particles, not, he has not done a binning as I did previously. Um, and you see the orbiting material being a cloud that do all sorts of stuff, but their average is on zero. And what do you see the infalling material do? They, are most, they mostly have negative velocities. But what you also see here, and you can see it actually in the full profile, is that we have some positions when we have increased concentrations of matter, right? Now, these are the caustics that I was talking to you about. We have a caustic here, we have a smaller one here, another one here, and all the way up. Whereas their, their intensity, let's say, uh, decreases as we move further out until at some point we reach the turnaround radius, right? Now, the, the problem with these caustics is due to the, uh, to the fact that these are not spherical structures, the uh, nonlinear dynamics, uh, whereas so here you, you can actually see it because we, we have the full profile, right? We have the all the, 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 the three-dimensional and uh, three-dimensional information of all the particles. But if you were to there you go again, sorry about that. Um, but if you actually go and see the density, the actual density profiles um, of um, of the individual clusters, you cannot see these costings. Now, what I did here was to take, um, let's say, about a thousand density profiles from a thousand um, um, galaxy clusters from simulations and plot their density, normalized, of course, with respect to the mean background density, and as a function of the radius with respect from, from the center of, of, of the clusters. Now, I have normalized the radius with respect to the turnaround radius, but that's not that's not of importance here. What I mean to, to show you here is the fact that, first of all, the uh, the profile, so individual profiles, you can see them uh, with a blue color, uh, and uh, more intense color, that means a red color depicts a higher profile density. So the different colors, yeah, they depict the, the, the profile density. And what we, the, the, the idea behind this is, I don't know if I can zoom, uh, the idea behind this is to, to see, first of all, that there is a universal pattern to the pro profile, that, which means that most of the profiles seem to follow a unique profile. This is 
uh, known for a long time you know, from simulations. Uh, that's one. And the second is we cannot see the caustics in the actual profile. Uh, the interesting thing is that the position at which we see the caustics is in the way that the slope of the profile changes. So again, here you see the median profile from um, Benedict Dimmer simulations. Uh, so essentially what he does, he has isolated this red band here, the median profile here. He, of course, having the, the know-how has uh, distinguished between the different components contributing to the profile. This is the infalling component of the density, and this is the orbiting component of the density. And he has also plotted the log slope of the profile. Now, as you see, at some point, the, uh, the slope of the profile changes very abruptly. Uh, so this, the, this, this change here, the fact that um, we have this deepening at the, at, the, at the slope of the profile means that at this point we have a, a change in, a, a, something happens that changes the slope, that changes the behavior of the average profile. Uh, what happens there and what is interesting is this cost, actually. This is where you see, at this position is where you see the abrupt change in the slope of the profile. Now, why this is important uh, is, uh, is the following. So, at very large scales, we have the profile that tries to reach the mean matter density in the universe. The profile tries to become flat, right? It will flatten out and then we will just see, no matter how big our sphere is, we will just see uh, the mean matter density of the universe. As you go further in though, as you approach uh, a structure, a big structure, a galaxy cluster, at some point, so, right, we have the mean matter density and that is reflected at the slopes. The slopes want to become zero, right? If the slope doesn't change, it means that the profile remains constant forever. As you go further in, at some point, you have to take the profile needs to change in such a way, its slope needs to change, to change in such a way uh, that it will, it will account for the fact that we have the caustics, that we have these increased concentrations of matter at, at, at this distance. And then of course, it needs to find the collapse structure at, at some point. So the idea is that the turnaround radius lies at the point after which the profile changes its behavior from trying to reach the mean matter density in the universe here or here, to trying to account for the fact that we have a caustic at this point. So the turnaround radius is expected to lie at the position here, because where else could it be? After this point, the profile will eventually smoothly reach the mean matter density in the universe, the background material. And uh, from the inside, this radius, it will try to find the caustic. Right, this concentration of matter that we see here. Yeah, of course. This changes uh, in time. Yeah. yeah, yeah, of course. This this is static in time. It's static. Exactly. So if you change the time, if you understand, you give us a density wave. Exactly. It's not the same matter all the time, but it's a density. Wave. Exactly, exactly, exactly. And actually, this caustic here, this behavior here, is very, very much affected by the accretion rate of the of the of the cluster. So, if this cluster is accreting material very violently, uh, this behavior will propagate to to where you will find the caustic, uh, because the particles will will um, descend towards the center after their first turn around with a much higher velocity. So you expect it to be much more concentrated if the accretion rate is is higher. People have have studied that this behavior and they have seen that. That was a very good question. Now, what is of interest to us though is where we where we can see the turnaround in in the behavior of the density profile. Uh, and the turnaround is here. I will show that later on in a later slide, but actually um, I shifted, the whole discussion shifted from uh, 
discussing velocity profiles and where we can see the turnaround in velocity profiles to densities, because in reality, in, in an observation, it is very, very, very tough to reconstruct the actual three-dimensional velocity profile of matter around the cluster. It is very, very tough because on the plane of the sky, you have lo you, you lose two degrees of freedom in the velocities. You only see the line of sight velocities. Whereas at the densities, and of course now these are three-dimensional densities, but at the densities, you only lose one degree of freedom because you only have the material projected on the plane. And so you have you know, two, 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 two axes. Um, now, you would argue that if what we are hunting is the change in the slope of the profile, uh, and it is so tough to see in three dimensions simulations, why would, would we be able to see that in observations? And I would answer to that, that we already have, actually. These are the projected uh, galaxy densities. So it is number density of galaxies around clusters, observed clusters from SDSS. Um, and this is actually the mean profile. Now, don't pay attention to the two different uh, figures because um, they just um, distinguish between two populations of clusters, uh, clusters that are very concentrated, highly concentrated, and clusters that are less concentrated. Uh, this is important for the splashback, for the feature here, but it's not so important for the turnaround. Uh, but what I mean to show you here is that this is from observations, right? The figure on the right is the log slope of the of this profile, how the slope of the profile changes. And they have seen this deepening, this change in the slope. They have observed that. Uh, so even though the profile is cut um, at a very small radii at three megaparsecs, I would argue that the turnaround is somewhere here. It, this, the profile is flattening due to the cut, but at some point it would, of course, must reach the mean uh, projected matter density, right? At some point, if you increase your annulus at an observation, at some point you, you, you must find the mean, right? Um, so what I mean to show you here is that we have observed this cost, this change in the behavior. Um, and now I will showcase uh, where exactly we expect to, um, to find this turnaround. Um, this is uh, the median um, density profile with respect to the radius, again, the turnaround radius. Uh, the blue is the median and the shaded region, which you unfortunately cannot see at the projector, is the one sigma spread of the profiles. Um, and with the magenta dust line, we have plotted, um, we have plotted what we expect the profile to do on large scales uh, if we were to assume uh, Gaussian statistics on the distribution of uh, the densities at the early universe. So what we did was to, we used uh, excursion set theory in order to get um, the, um, the, mass, the, the mass function of, uh, of collapsed uh, structures at an early universe, and then we use the spherical collapse model in order to evolve these um, these over densities. So, long story short, what we get, what we can, uh, what we can model uh, very easily is um, the the average profile that you expect to get if at the early universe you had um, uh, Gaussian statistics, and if you had uh, the if you had spherical symmetry, right? Now, this assumption of spherical symmetry, uh, of course, makes the profile to completely fail at small scales, right? So here you can see we, we do a, a very, very bad job in order to, to model the actual simulated profile of realistic structures. But what we do a very good job at is to model the, the behavior on the outskirts of the, of the profile. So, what we can model is the density on very, very large scales. And this magenta um, line that you see here, we have not fitted this profile. We have just overplotted the profile. What you only need is the cosmological parameters. 
what is the normalization of the power spectrum, what is the uh, omega matter, what is the omega lambda, and what is the mass of your sample, which you can know. So we have not fit that. That's why you do not see a perfect uh, correspondence between the two. We could have fitted the profile, but that is not what we want to do. What we wanted to show is that um, regardless of the cluster that you pick, their outer density profile has a universal behavior we can, which we can describe from first principles. Now, why this is interesting? This assumption of spherical symmetry makes the profile fail not here, but, but if you see the slopes of the profile, the, this is the, 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 lo, the logarithmic slope of the profile. The magenta is the logarithmic slope of the analytical prediction, and the blue is of the median. The change in the slope of the median. Here you see the behavior of the caustic, what, what, we, what we discussed previously, right? Of the actual profile. But if you see under the assumption of spherical symmetry, what you, what you get is that you completely fail to get these caustics here, right? But what you do get is the behavior beyond the turnaround, where the turnaround radius lies. When the two behaviors split, when the analytical prediction from the spherical collapse deviates from the realistic fact by the actual, the realistic profile of, you know, um, uh, simulated uh, cl clusters. So while you cannot see that on the actual profile, you can see that on the, on the change of the slope, right? The slope changes much, much faster uh, here than it does here. You cannot observe it on the actual profile. So what we argue is that the turnaround is at the position where, where the slope of the density changes. Um, it, it, it deviates from what you would expect if you had um, a universe that was spherically symmetric. That's the expectation. And the good news is that this is this expectation is very, very simple to, to, um, to model. You can actually, by the way, you, you, you can even pick a more uh, complicated model than the one we picked. It's not a perfect model. Uh, the, what I want to highlight here is not that this model is important, but that we can use, we can, by modeling the outer profile of clusters beyond the turnaround, and we only need spherical, the assumption of first spherical symmetry for that, we can actually get the turnaround radius from uh, the profiles. So uh, the vertical lines are the 10% a 10, a 10 uh, error in the, in the radius. I've put that in order to guide my eye, actually. Uh, and because you, it would be completely unrealistic to expect to be always spot on to, to your identification of the radius. We expect to have an error, right? Uh, you, if, if this profile were to get noisier than that, this is not a noisy profile because I have stuck many, many clusters. But if we had a very noisy profile, it wouldn't be very easy to, to distinguish this behavior. That's why we expect to have an error. Now, a, la a last point, we have observed this behavior on clusters, right? So I think that this addresses the issue of, of the, um, I will not discuss that actually, but I think that this addresses the issue of the, how we would go about measuring the, the, the turnaround radius. We would get many profiles, stack them, and look at the behavior of the densities in order to, to find the turnaround radius. Next question. How do we go about measuring the mass on that scale? Because we need the density, right? So we need to observe the mass. Now, in order to do that, what I did, so one way to do it is just stack many profiles, get their weak lensing signal, which will track the mass density, and just go to that scale and measure the mass. That's one way. The problem with that, with that is that weak lensing measurements, um, first of all, to, to go at such large scales, you need to stack, that's one. And the second problem is, um, that from weak lensing, your, your redshift beams of your stacked uh, clusters will be very big. 
So this is one issue. And until uh, I, I'm not aware of if we can address that, to, to, if there are techniques in order to make the must be the red shift beams uh, narrower. But until that, what I thought would be uh, very good to do was to develop scaling relations. So, so the idea is the following. <clears throat> Again, here, what you see is uh, about a thousand density profiles from simulations. But now what you see is the density as a function of an enclosed mass. So what we have is a sphere, the density in that sphere on the y-axis, and on the x-axis, we have the enclosed mass on that sphere, normalized with respect to the, to the mass M200. This is a mass that we observe from X-rays. We observed from weak, from weak lensing, even from uh, from the SZ effect. This is a mass that we can observe from uh, from actual clusters, right? So again, what you see is that there is a unique profile, right? Even though different clusters do a different thing, there is a universal behavior, which, of course, we have modeled with the magenta line. This is the median of this profile here. And with the magenta, we see the prediction of the model that I discussed previously. Of course, the model fails uh, close to the realization because we have assumed the spherical collapse model, which, as I said, uh, assumes that uh, at the realization we have infinite density. But we do a pretty decent job on the, on the larger scales, right? So the idea is, if you know analytically the density as a function of enclosed mass, then no one can stop you from analytically connecting the mass where you assume to have a collapse, M200, with the mass at whichever over density you like. So if you know the mass here, you can predict the mass here, for example, right? Analytically. So we developed the scaling relation and going to simulations, what we did, and this paper will hopefully by the end of the week be out, um, we contrasted the actual value of the turnaround mass from simulations with the one that we would predict if we were to use the scaling relation. So we feed M200, which is something we can observe, uh, and we get a prediction for the turnaround mass. And what we see is the percentage fractional difference between the two. And as you can see, there is a distribution which is very, very centered closely to zero. By the way, I have done this comparison for different cosmologies. I, I don't want to take more of your time. The point is that this scaling relation works and there is no wonder why it works. We can model the average profile, right? So on average, we should expect to get um, a very good prediction for the mass. Of course, there is a tail here, but the peak of the distribution is around zero. So wrapping things up, um, we have examined the turnaround scale which is a scale predicted from the spherical collapse model. And we have seen that the matter density on this scale, the turnaround density, and its evolution with cosmic time predicts cosmology, probes cosmology in this model. Now, we have, uh, we have compared the prediction of this idealistic model with realistic structures. And then we have discussed how we can go about uh, performing, making a measurement of this density for realistic structures. And the idea is to use density profiles. We will use, uh, we will try to look where the slope of the profile changes in order to track where you get the, the turnaround radius, where is the scale. And then as a first step, use scaling relations in order to get the mass on this, um, on this scale. The good news about the mass is, uh, well, or rather, the good news about the radius is that we have seen the feature uh, of the caustics at the profile. So we can we have seen in actual clusters where the profile changes its behavior, and then 
uh, the idea is to look for the turnaround radius there. And the good news about the mass is that even if we cannot actually measure the mass so that we can validate the usefulness of the scaling relations, we can actually um, see the, the validate the scaling relations by measuring the mass at a, sm at a smaller over density uh, or rather at a higher over density than that uh, of the turnaround uh, and compare it with an actual observation of, of, of the mass there. So I think we can do a good job validating the scaling relations. Uh, and like a takeaway take take away message from this talk would be, in my opinion, the following. We have extensively studied the inner portions of galaxy clusters. We have, we are doing this for 30 years now. They have gi given us a plethora of very, very interesting information and they have helped us build a good understanding of what is the universe in which we live. But what we have not done a very good job at is studying their outer portions of, of these clusters. And what I'm trying to show you here is that there is very, very unique and new information at those scales. So we should start looking there uh, at these scales of, of the structure. So this, in my opinion, should be the takeaway message. Thank you so much. If you have any questions. Well, thank you very much for this very, very interesting and very promising, I think, talk for all the information you gave us. Uh, it's time for questions. I, I, I have, well, we are not exactly in the field, so uh, excuse me if there are very simple the questions. We start from uh, a, a spherical system mm -hmm. that collapses radially, right? Mm -hmm. So, having in mind the old uh, models of uh, observed, of course, nowadays. Of galaxy formations, the monolithic collapse. Yeah. So there were two scenarios. One was that they were collapsing like this, and then yeah, yeah. the ellipticals, and then the other scenario we had also kind of rotation. Yeah. Then, so in this case, we don't need to have any uh, assumption about. Uh, no, we, we do not need need it actually. That's that's the so. Uh, if as, as you scale, yes exactly the, the thing is that at this scale you do not expect a rotation you are so far away so far away from the center of the structure that's one uh, the second the second reason is that as you go further in uh, this assumption of spherical symmetry breaks because you are you get very very much deeper to the nonlinear regime. On the one hand, and on the second hand, the many the many body interactions there they completely break down the, the, the spherical symmetry assumption. So you do not expect to work. But on these scales, um, it is much more likely to find a structure that does not deviate so dramatically from sphe spherical symmetry. That's why this model works actually. Okay, so there are any other questions? Uh, I don't know about uh, from the audience. Yeah, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. From the zoom. With your envelope simulation, yes. can you find uh, how much uh, this spherical symmetry deviates from the real shape of the moon? Of course. So, the, so uh, one, one information that I have hidden from you is the fact that in order to get this good agreement between the simulate the simulation, the value of the turnaround density from simulations with the prediction of the spherical collapse model, I need to throw away some structures. So in order for this to work, you need to throw away the highly non-spherical structures. So if you find a structure that looks like a cigar, which I have in simulations, or like a pancake, this will blur the, 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 the image. But I don't mean to say that you need only to pick the most spherically looking structures. You just have to discard the most highly non-spherical. Although, even, even if you consider those a cigar-like structure, what you, would exp what you would see in this figure would be the following. These points here at small redshifts would be shifted at higher values, making it impossible to distinguish between the models. But as you go out, you can still distinguish between different cosmologies. So even if you do no filtering, you expect as you go at higher redshifts, and of course now we have observed clusters beyond red one, 
uh, and this will get even better in uh, in a few years. Uh, even if you do no filtering at high redshifts, you would be uh, you would be able to distinguish between a model with from a model without a cosmological constant. Yeah. Okay. So let me check if there are some yeah, sure. questions. Yeah. Let me have a water. Okay. Here. Uh, anybody who wants to ask something? Uh, can you raise your, your hand or just speak? So I don't see anyone. No, right. Yeah, I have a quick question here. Uh, Dimo, is that you? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I joined very late, so okay. I don't. Hey, please go on. I, I saw these uh, pictures. Those are from the simulations. Yeah. What about the real observations? So, which pictures? The the radial velocity profiles. Well, what you have here, yes, the turnover, right? That's a turnaround. So, yeah, that's the velocity profile. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. Now, this uh, slide here uh, wants to. The, the idea behind these slides are twofold. Uh, the one reason I'm showing to you is to give you a very easy way to measure the turnaround from simulations so that you can compare this with a prediction of a spherical collapse model later and to get an idea of what happens at the turnaround, right? Now, okay. you will not observe that. You can not, there is no way you can observe that because these are the, you have all the information. These are radial velocities. In the sky, you will only have line of sight velocities. Okay. That's why later I shifted the discussion towards the density profiles. Now, I, I discussed the caustic, the fact that you have concentrate, matter concentrated here, which is the effect of cell crossing. And I discussed how you can track this behavior to the change of the slope of the profile and where you can look for the turnaround, where you would look here at this region. That's what I discussed. Now, the observation part, because again, this is three-dimensional, uh, the observational part is this. Uh, here you can see the projected the number density of galaxies around clusters, actual clusters from SDSS. Uh, these, of course, are the median profiles. They have stacked the, um, uh, the galaxy number density profiles from individual clusters. And what I mean to, sh to show you is that uh, people have observed this change in the behavior of the of the profile, even though we are no longer in three dimensions. We not hey, only, uh, that's only... that's good. Hold yeah. on a second. So this is now surface density as a function of uh, as a function of distance, right? Exactly. I see, and that drops like what? I mean, there's a power law dependence here. Uh, what do you mean, due to the slope? The the slope, yes, the slope. The, so uh, the, the you know, it's, sigma no, it's, that's, uh, that's, that's it's right. not that's it's not simple to say that is a power law. If you are familiar with um, density profiles, um, usually the the, the most uh, common um, model uh, uh, models that we use in order to uh, describe these profiles. The most common one is the NFW profile, right, or the yeah. INASTO profile. These profiles in three dimensions, you can see that they do a decent job on the inner parts of the cluster of, of the clusters here, right? Even so it's up to the minus three. Yeah, exactly. But I wouldn't say it's a simple power law because then the the, the slope changes. Yeah, so uh, at the end it has to change, right? Exactly. Where it is a simpler power law, what is a simpler power law is this profile. So if you disregard the fact that you have cell crossing and at some point you have a, co a collapsed structure, so this magenta line, then you could sort of get a power law, which is not a straightforward like R to the minus, you know, whatever. It's not simple because it changes, but uh, the on the uh, on the larger scales, it looks more like a power law here but if you want to consider the whole profile then one power law would not be enough i see uh, so 
So which vertical line is the turnaround? The, the, the turnaround, uh, you find the turnaround at the point where the profile, the simple power law of the large scales deviates from the more complicated behavior of the actual profile. Okay. This is here. You do not, it is not sharp, but within a 10% error, you can, you can mm -hmm. see it, actually. Mm -hmm. That's the idea. Okay. So... Ah, okay, you have something more to ask uh, Demos? Actually, no, no, thank you. Hi. Then let's check if there is anybody else who wants to ask. So but these are observations now? Or yeah, yeah, this is observations. These oh, are right. DSS yes. uh, clusters, and the, the clusters were identified with this red mapper from algorithm. This is an algorithm, they have produced a catalog, and yes. it is publicly so, available. <clears throat> yeah. So that's the R200. I guess R200 uh, is the... Uh, it is uh, the radius R200. where you... It is the radius where you expect uh, to have a density 200 times the mean. This radius. So this is already 200 times the mean, what you have there. Yes, yes. But actually, fr frankly, I would expect the turnaround to be around here. Now, th there is... Yes, that's there is right. No... I, would, I would think so. Yes. Yeah, but, but uh, two things. First of all, the profile is cut on three megaparsecs, right? Uh, there is no way that the slope of the density will remain negative forever. At some point, and I don't expect it to be at much, much larger uh, radii, but at some point, you expect to find the mean two-dimensional profile, right? If you take yes. an annulus on the sky and you increase its right. radius, at some point, you so, need to mean. So this... At, after this point, which I expect, I expect to be flat because of the cut mm -hmm. uh, and because of the modeling, uh, this should uh, reach zero. Yes, it should. But you do not see it here because of the modeling and because of the cut. I have not gone to, to, to observations because, I mean, I, I didn't have the time. It, 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 it took... No, no, the issue is... Uh... Do we ever get that, or there's is there always a place in the space that we, we find? We absolutely can go to higher to higher uh, scales, absolutely. And people have done this, so mm -hmm. uh, they, they have produced profiles on larger scales uh, from weak lensing. Uh, yes, that's exactly my point. Yeah, the, weak the lensing is my point because not... I ask usually people that I don't know and. Uh, uh, is there any place in the sky where it's uh, free of weak lensing? Yeah. So the if we stuck the so the problem with weak lensing is that it does a good job for individual structures at small scales. You have a high signal there. As the scale increases, the noise increases and the signal signal falls. So what you do uh, is that you stack. You stack many profiles with similar behavior in order to increase your signal. Now, uh, people have done that. And so good news with weak lensing is that you do not get a number density, but you get a mass density, right? Um, and people have done that for big clusters and they have a very, very strong signal up to 30 megaparsecs. At 30 megaparsecs, I, I, I'm like, two times the turnaround or three times the turnaround. So it is enough for me. Okay. Uh, All right. Fine. Okay. So up to 30 megaparsecs, you can see. No, no. Those, you see weak lensing in those distances? You you, weak, you have weak lensing, weak lensing signal up to 30 megaparsecs. The turnaround, you expect it to be at less than 10, like six. Okay. Or... Fair enough. Fair enough. But the... Uh, uh, so weak lensing has to do with the fact, I'm, I'm sorry for getting off uh, the main topic here. Oh, no, this uh, the weak lens has to do with the shape of galaxies, you see, right? How they, if that is, so somehow you have to calibrate that. So you must have some place where you, there's no uh, lensing and therefore you can look for galaxies to see the shapes of galaxies there. And the question is, is there a place in the sky which is, 
free of weak lenses so you can calibrate the distribution of galaxies. But maybe that, but that's a different question. I I should not insist on that. Yes, that's that's question, right. but uh, unfortunately, I do not know the answer since I'm not in. Okay, that, it's okay. That's that's something to have in mind. That's all. Yeah. Uh, but I'm sure I'm sure they. I mean, your um, um, your question is spot on. I, you cannot produce a map if you do not uh, do this calibration. So so we I, have strong lens in up to up to two thousand two hundred basically. Okay. Excuse me, I didn't, I didn't hear you. Strong lensing, strong lensing. We will have up to R200. Uh, yeah, but the problem with strong lensing is uh, that, so you would need to have, I think, a very a very big cluster that is very concentrated. Uh, and I don't know how, ma how many such clusters we have. So the problem with strong lensing would be the amount of sources that we have observed. Yes. So we need lots of clusters and strong lensing. I don't think it has produced uh, in the range of tens of thousands. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. All right. I don't want to insist anymore. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's too early here. <laughs> uh, thank you. For thank joining. you so much. Thank you for joining. Uh, it was yeah. it's really very early out there. Okay, so uh, I don't think there are more questions. Well, final check. Okay. okay. Then Yorgos, uh, thank you very much thank again. You so much. Thank you very much again. Uh, thank you so much. Best success to your studies and research. So bye bye, everybody. Bye everybody. <laughs>